So as bar another paid fan request, I'm doing the Short Circuit Duology, a series of two films released in 1986 and 1988 respectively. It seems now that I look at it that there were more duologies than Ghostbusters in the 80s. I remember with Ghostbusters 2 in particular, I asked my mum why they didn't make a Ghostbusters 3, as I really wanted to see a third movie. 3 is a special number, not 2. Well, that's the reality we live under. Maybe that's why I could more easily get behind Terminator 3 than other people. If you're going to make more than one movie, make three of them, not two. So, I guess that's my first gripe. Although, from what Wikipedia says, the second short circuit film didn't meet the financial success of the first film. Ah well, maybe they tried to make a trilogy after all. So after looking at the title, I had no idea what the movies would be about. It's another robot movie it looked to me. Didn't Nintendo do something with a similar looking design or something? I remember watching an angry video game nerd video about it somewhere. So I was expecting a generic movie about a robot. Well, the film is very simple, but it's actually pretty okay. I'm doing this in two parts. I'm going to watch the first movie and then write the review, then do the second movie and then write the review. If the two reviews were intertwined, I feel like it'll result in a mixed in review. I don't know. I'd rather make this as long and detailed as I can. So let's start with the first short circuit movie. Now I shortly realized a quarter of the way through that this is a movie about a machine gaining sentience. To be honest, unless there's something new brought to the table, I feel like it's a concept that's played the fuck out. I remember in a movie like iRobot for example, which I also hear butchered the source material by Isaac Asimov, the movie has a robot that becomes self-aware but for some reason acts exactly like a human right off the bat, and has a robot rebellion for no logical reason. They ignore the three laws set up in the movie, and didn't come up with a clever loophole or anything. If if a robot was locked in a paradox, that would be it. They'd try to combat it to the best of their ability and probably crash and shut down. That's my guess anyways. From your point of view, I don't know tech stuff. Also, the film has Will Smith and Shia LaBeouf in it, and that was one weird combination. The only weirder casting choice seems to be The Acolyte, which has Lee Jung Jae from Squid Game, Daphne Keen from Logan, and Carrie Ann Moss from The Matrix. What the fuck? With that being said, when it comes to this movie, the robot sentience thing was by the books. But what it does better than something like iRobot is that there's proper build up. The first thing I'll say is that the soundtrack is alright I suppose. The music that plays in the film's intro can get annoying, but aside from that, the movie starts with the main robots in the movie doing a military demonstration, destroying stuff and whatnot. So basically the setup is that some machines have been created by Nova Laboratory Robotics, five of them to be exact. Well, right off the bat, the fifth robot grows a conscious and escapes the laboratory. What's done better than iRobot is that the fifth robot doesn't start off fully characteristic of a human. It still acts like a robot, albeit one that's gained sentience. The human characters in this movie, I'd say are well written. They aren't very complex characters, but the approach they go for works. The movie starts off with these machines being programmed to destroy. The guy that designed them, a young man named Newton Crosby, mentions how he didn't actually want them to be used for destruction. Well, the Nova Robotics are signed in with a military contract in which they'll be used to fight in American wars. As I said, number five strays off the path, escapes Nova Robotics, and none of the input commands work on him. You see, the reason why robot sentience doesn't always work is because in a lot of these stories, robots were designed to follow their programming, and the programming makes up all of how they think. That's why it's iffy why number 5 isn't struggling with its programming or something. I presume that this gain of sentience started before the movie began. Or that number 5 found a way to cancel out its programming inputs or something. Because this gets really confusing when you think about it logically. Since all 5 robots are armed with weapons, Nova Robotics and the army panic that the potentially dangerous number 5 could come and destroy everything in its path. Fortunately though, they can still relatively track it. 
being pursued by Nova, number five jumps off a bridge and uses a parachute. And it's here where one of the main characters comes into shape. A young woman named Stephanie Speck, a gal who lives in Oregon. So the movie is basically a pursuit premise, where Nova tries to capture number five, and we see that Stephanie is basically an animal person, and that she has a douchey and abusive ex-boyfriend who gives her so much shit. So as you can probably guess, number five comes across her home, where Stephanie mistakes her for an alien. I thought that was pretty weird. Who would mistake this for an alien? It's clearly a robot. Maybe she could make the mistake that it's an alien probe or something, but other than that, nada. Point is though, it was sort of cringe watching Stephanie mistake number 5 for an alien. It's here where number 5 opts to watch television, including stuff like the Three Stooges. There's also a gimmick number 5 has, where he plays sounds from television or the radio, sort of like Bumblebee and Michael Bay's Transformers. I'd also like to mention that Newton has a sort of sidekick, a foreign dude named Ben Jabutia. I can't remember how it's pronounced exactly. Ben's character is essentially those stereotypes about Indian people where they don't know about American culture and that sort of stuff. Newton and Ben talk about how Newton might actually get a girlfriend now that he's out of the lab. From that moment, I easily connected the dots and realized that this movie is going to ship Newton and Stephanie. I called it from a mile away, even though they haven't even met yet. Maybe it just feels a little too tropish to have the two human leads of the opposite gender get together. But hey, I'm not going to question it. A lot of movies do this stuff. Might not be realistic, but this ain't reality. This is a movie. It pushes the suspension of disbelief enough is what I'm saying. Basically, Stephanie realizes when number five is tipped over that he's actually a robot. She calls Nova Robotics, in which they arrive very soon. Although as number five has slowly been gaining sentience, he realizes that he's going to be disassembled and takes Stephanie's food truck and drives off, with Stephanie grabbing onto the truck and finding her way in. This movie so far has been light-hearted sequences of number 5, and the human character screwing around. Tension is fairly okay, but with that being said, there's a bizarre sequence where number 5 learns to drive, in which he does so recklessly. Yeah, so this movie is very tropish if I do say so myself. It's basically a crazy antics with a robot kind of movie. Not very original, but still, it's serviceable as a movie, also, I have to say that the actress who plays Stephanie has really awkward chemistry with number five. I presume it's the same problem where actors have to imagine stuff in front of them. At best, there would have been a practical model there, but not else to make it easier. And I potentially imagine number five's voice actor recording in a booth or something detached from the footage. Although Stephanie acts very off when she interacts with other human characters too, like Newton and Ben for example. It's a very unnatural feeling performance for the most part. So eventually, Nova takes number 5 back, but not before number 5 blasts the shit out of the guys with the guns, going full Michael Bay on everything, but eventually, Newton is able to deactivate number 5, where number 5 pleads that he is alive. Well, after the shutoff, number 5 is taken by Ben and a Nova guard, presumably back to the lab. Well, number 5 manages to reactivate itself and forces Ben and the guard to stop the car, in which they both run out to avoid getting blasted by a laser. Number 5 hijacks the car and drives off without a care in the world. Newton later picks up Ben and the guard at a later point. Number 5 proceeds to return to Stephanie when she's taking a bath. Uh... Anyways, the movie kind of shows chemistry between Stephanie and number 5 for a bit after that. It does an okay job at showing number 5's self-awareness, but it's not particularly that memorable a moment in the movie. Eventually, Stephanie's douchey ex-boyfriend shows up to collect the reward on behalf of Nova. That is where number 5 opts him to get him to buzz off with his pants down. Eventually, Crosby convinces Stephanie to meet him, partially because Crosby wants to examine number 5, but also because he like, like Stephanie. The meeting is eventually ruined as it turns out the guy in the military was spying on both of them, as number 5 has to outwit his counterparts. By that, 
I mean he disables the other units, built the same way as him. The sequence is kinda cool seeing number 5 out with the other robots. He later reprograms them to act like the three stooges and whatnot. In front of the military guys and Crosby when beforehand they were arguing. With that being said, Crosby and Stephanie later meet up in private, and it's here where Crosby comes to fully realize number five sentience. Now, the nature of number five sentience was very much questionable based on execution, but I still like the scene where Crosby tests number five and realizes that he's a truly fully independent thinking artificial intelligence that quickly picks up on human cues, such as when he tells a crappy joke and number five gets it. So Crosby realizes that his creation has gained sentience, but since the military guys are out to search and destroy number five, the movie ends with number five creating a decoy that has blown up faster than Michael Bay can say genius. Awesome barbecue. Awesome pull. Crosby says that he technically owns a secluded ranch in Montana through family, I believe. And so the movie ends with radio and laughter and driving off and that sort of happy ending. Now, I don't dislike this movie, but I found it to be kind of iffy with its concept. I can say that they build up to number 5 slowly building its sentience and independence more and more, but it gaining sentience in the first place and ignoring its specific programming was kind of pushing it. I think it would have been better if maybe number 5 was a prototype that was trusted to do things in service of its masters, but the programming in that regard was loose or something. I don't know, I'm just spitballing. I wouldn't know what I would do. I think a premise like this is too simple to have any real commentary, especially how it's done. So for now, I'd say I'd give the first short circuit movie a 6.5 out of 10. Inoffensive, decently made, but lacking in something more interesting. So what about the second movie? The first movie was pretty self-contained. It had a beginning, middle, and end. I sat down to watch the sequel a little bit after I watched the first movie, expecting the same kind of rehashy sequel with a new gimmick. Like, think back to a movie like Home Alone 2, for example. That movie had the same beats as the original, with basically a few things swapped out. Having Kevin be lost in New York instead of his local neighborhood in Chicago was a clear example of this. They wanted a bigger story, but they didn't really earn it per se. That's not to say I dislike Home Alone 2. It's not a very creative sequel, but it gave us more of the same charm regardless. Coincidentally, this sequel also takes place in a big city, with that being the emphasis. The movie doesn't actually specify which city it is, so I'm going to presume it's New York, as that's what it most resembles to me. Before I watched this movie, I learned that the only human character to fully return was the Indian guy Ben. The movie starts with Ben selling mini robots based on number 5 and the rest of the robots from Nova Robotics. It's revealed that he's been fired from Nova since the last movie. At first the movie seemed kind of iffy, as only one human character returning seemed to me like they couldn't afford the actors from the previous movie or there were scheduling conflicts that resulted in them unable to come back for the sequel. I was quickly surprised to see though that the new human characters are full of personality and charisma. It also felt shortly in that that there was a probable reason for certain characters not to return. At the very least, Ben references his friends a lot, so we're reminded that they do exist. Well anyways, the kickstarter for this movie's plot is that the previously mentioned Ben, after being fired from Nova Robotics, is presumably in New York, so I'll just call it that, and a young woman named Sandy, whose job it is to find toy manufacturers, discovers the mini number 5 robot, after shenanigans where it goes far outside the reach of Ben, and she asks him if he can make a thousand of them. During the opening sequence of the movie, there was a vendor right next to Ben, a con man named Fred who decides to hop into Ben's business, posing as his partner in business as he seizes the opportunity in teaming up with them. To be fair though, he sort of helps Ben with the challenge of making a thousand robots by the time of the deadline Sandy set for them. How he does that? Well he talks to Lone Shark of course, isn't that a great idea? This is the stereotypical movie Loan Shark, where if you don't pay them back in time, you'll have your thumbs broken. So while he's securing finances, it's not through a risk-free way. So Ben and Fred renovate a worn-down warehouse to make the mini-robots. 
Problem is, though, the warehouse was unofficially occupied by two thieves trying to break into a vault to steal some jewels. They come out and cause a disturbance, destroying all the progress the workers did thus far. So with all their progress destroyed, Ben asks help from his friends in Montana, Stephanie and Newton, in which they send over number 5, who decided to call himself Johnny 5 at the end of the last movie. Anyways, Johnny 5 as we'll now call him, arrives at the warehouse in a big packaging box, and gets straight to work making mini versions of himself. He's shown to be super fast and efficient. They introduce him around the 17 minute mark, and given this movie is 1 hour and 50 minutes long, including credits, this was an appropriate time. Johnny Five does have his own personal conflict in the story, so it isn't like he's being thrown in because this is a sequel, and that's it. I have to say firsthand that the movie is pretty well paced. While it isn't a huge leap forward, I'd actually say this is a moderate improvement over the original. The original movie had characters, especially Stephanie, interact awkwardly around number five, which is a problem a lot of movies face when there isn't a real thing in front of them. Talking to them, that's what it felt like anyways. Well, here, interactions between characters and Johnny Five feel more natural. It actually feels like Johnny Five and whatever human character are actually speaking to each other. I'm going to presume that they learnt from the first movie and better managed to make the on-screen interactions feel more real and natural. We also notice Johnny Five being so much more sociable than the end of the previous movie. If the first movie was number five, slowly building his sentience and self-awareness, then the sequel is about Johnny Five coming to terms with the fact that he isn't a human. Since he's in a big metropolis, a lot of people presume that he's a remote control machine performer or whatnot. There's actually a part where a bunch of carjackers trick him into opening up all the cars so that they can steal the possessions inside and whatnot and they spray paint him afterwards. Johnny Five is found and returned by a bank manager or someone, who later turns out to be in league with the robbers earlier in the movie. So there's three of them trying to break into a vault to steal diamonds. It's here where Fred through dialogue finds out that Johnny Five is worth 11 million dollars. For modern standards, that's a whopping 25 million. Point is though, it's shown that Fred isn't the most trustworthy character. He isn't a villain so to say, but he's also a pretty bad character in a lot of ways. He actually tries to sell Johnny Five to a robotics company, but Johnny escapes out the window and glides away. There's also a subplot of Fred encouraging Ben to pursue Sandy as a romantic interest to distract him while he sells Johnny Five. This actually leads to some cringy in a good way scenes where Ben fails to charm Sandy and she has no idea what he's trying to say. It's here where Johnny Five is seen as a freak of nature by the people in the city and is arrested by the police. He, of course, is later retrieved by Ben and they walk at night and have a conversation about Ben charming Sandy. So there's a sequence of Ben trying to flirt with her and she feels the same way fortunately and is happy to hang out with Ben. And hey, the relationship isn't woke at all. It's an Indian man and a Caucasian woman but they use Ben's socially illiterate personality both from working for a robotics company for so long and also for being a foreigner to the film's advantage. I could say that there was tension in the fact that Ben is struggling to talk to Sandy yeah, I've been there, buddy. Still am for that matter, I guess. Well, things go downhill, not in quality, I mean, as the three robbers grab Ben and Fred the next day and throw them into a freezer of a Chinese restaurant, while the bank manager of the three tricks Johnny Five into digging into the vault. The both of them although manage to code message Sandy, who comes to their rescue, and it's here where the climax kicks in. Returning to the warehouse, Ben and Sandy get wrongly arrested as they are presumed to be the vault robbers, but Fred gets away. Fred on the run goes to look for Johnny Five, where Johnny Five, after being tricked and attacked, is trashed by the robbers. Fred finds him, and it's here where he kind of redeems himself. He actually helps repair Johnny in critical condition by listening to his instructions. I think I should say that Fred was still likeable despite being a shallow con man as well. He does enough good in the movie to make us not hate him. He helps Ben with the business, even though he had nothing to do with it originally for example. The part of the movie right now is where Fred improves as a character. Well the thing is, 
He helps repair Johnny Five, and Johnny Five gets like a mohawk and tracks down the damn robbers and beats the shit out of them. The former bank manager out of the three tries to escape on a speedboat, and they try to have this closing sequence, and it's actually pretty decent. Although they play that I Need a Hero song, and I just want to say that Shrek 2 did that better for its climax. Still though, Johnny Five thwarts the bad guys, but shuts off temporarily due to a leak, but is revived shortly after. And for his heroics, he is given United States citizenship and treated as an equal to any other US citizen. It's all done in a big ceremony. So that was a pretty decent movie. It's got enjoyability factor, and it's certainly rewatchable if you'd want to. Plus, it moderately improved on the original. Apparently, critics from the time disagree with me, but still, this is far from a badly made movie. I'd say I'd give it a 7.5, a point above the original. So that's the Short Circuit duology. The franchise barely has anything else. It says on Wikipedia that there was an attempted reboot, but it doesn't seem to have gone anywhere. I had never heard of these two movies prior to getting the request, but now that I have watched them, I'm glad that I did. They're not bad movies. They're certainly a decent relic of the 80s, but they're actually movies. They have a beginning, middle, and end, and I know I said that the idea of AI sentience was always iffy to me, depending on how it's done, but here it's done pretty decently. I don't quite understand the logistics behind number five sentience, but that's okay. The context we are given paints a decent enough picture. That's how I'd describe these movies. Decent movies from the time. They're leagues above shit made today. Maybe the 1980s were the best era for movies. They're not too old where they can't be watched by modern audiences, but they're also not too recent that it has any political or corporate interference smudged into them. Maybe both the 80s and 90s. I mean, that's where we got a lot of film franchises and IPs. Not all of them, but still, a lot of them. So that's my take on the Short Circuit movies. I still would have liked to see a third movie, because 3 is the magic number, but that's down to bad luck if anything. I'm Ginger Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Under the mountain, the golden fountain, were you praying that the Lara